Good morning, good evening, good afternoon for everyone joining us live and everyone else listening to us afterwards. I'm really pleased to be here with you today hosting this event from FIP on indoor, indoor air pollution and health causes management and self-care approaches. My name is Lena Badger. I'm the FIP program lead for everything equity, sustainability, policy and development. And joining me today supporting this event is my colleague Noor Al Tahla, FIP projects coordinator for the same program of work. Before we begin, I'd like to just run us through some house rules about the webinar. And thank you so much for everyone greeting us in the chat. Please introduce yourselves. We love engaging with you. Firstly, a reminder that this webinar is being recorded and live streamed via YouTube at the same time. The recording will be available on our website, events.fib.org for free. You may ask questions using the question box provided. So you can see the Q&A icon at the bottom. Please use that to input your questions. The moment you think of them, we'll pick them up later. You are always more than welcome to provide feedback to webinars at fip.org at any time. And finally, if you're not already, be, do become a member of FIP. You can find out everything about our membership through the uh, website. Today's overall aim is really all about supporting pharmacists and pharmacy professionals to play a proactive role in respiratory management of the health impact of indoor air pollution through helping to address their practice and education needs and enabling them to be better patient advice and self-care providers. So how are, you, how are we gonna do that? We have a few objectives today. You see them on screen, I'm not gonna run through all of them, but, but some of them are illustrating how air pollution might change the type of services offered by pharmacists. So if you are a pharmacist in practice, you might want to know how air pollution actually may directly impact the services you provide, identify the sources of indoor air pollution and how it increases threat to health, understand those uh, threats, short-term, long-term as, as well, particularly on children, Understand the clinical, pharmacological, and non-pharmacological treatments available, including self-care, and illustrate how advocacy can impact behavioral change that can support better self-care practice adoption, which eventually aims to reduce the health impact of air pollution. Before we also uh, begin, I'd like to really quickly thank on behalf of, of, of FIP, the uh, Clean Breathing Institute, TCBI, for supporting this online event. A very big thanks to, to them for supporting this event and previous activities, which we'll actually run, with, um, run through with you. So I just want to quickly, as, as lead for sustainability in pharmacy, really illustrates how this event and the topic we're discussing today aligns really well with the wider goal uh, at FIP of ensuring sustainability in pharmacy. If you're not familiar with the FIP development goals, we have 21 goals uh, for transforming pharmacy globally. You can find out all about our goals um, on developmentgoals.fib.org. The last but not least goal, goal 21, is on sustainability in pharmacy. This covers sustainability in practice, in science, as well as workforce. And really a lot of what we're discussing here relates to the practice element and looking at minimizing the impact of pharmacy on the environment, but also managing the health impacts of environmental pollution uh, on services and air, indoor air pollution is one such important issue. You can visit uh, our Sustainability Rx website, which is linked in the chat to find out more about the program uh, and the other activities we run within. But at the moment, the three areas of work uh, within Sustainability Rx are responding to disasters and pandemics. So pandemic preparedness, response and recovery, we've classed as part of sustainability in pharmacy is such an important core uh, part of our profession now. And of course, everything environment and planetary health, including climate change, which we're touching on today, and sustainable services and ensuring um, continued services in pharmacy. So these are the three areas of our Sustainability Rx program 
Um, and really, I would say number two, uh, environment and planetary health is what we're touching on today very heavily. So very excited to, uh, to do this with you today. Uh, I wanted to just give you some background. This is not our first uh, piece of work with TCBI. Uh, we have run a roundtable on air pollution in 2021, the global threat of air pollution and its impact on patient care, how we can support pharmacy practice and workforce development. And we published a report on the outcomes of this roundtable. And you can access the report online via the QR code you see online or the link that's linked in the chat and you can see online. So this was a really important important report, which we then used to develop and launch uh, a call to action. But some of the key messages in this report are really about, again, advocating for pharmacists and how they're ideally positioned to tackle air pollution and its impact on health, particularly respiratory health, what services that are needed to address these effects and impacts. Uh, and the current, uh, the current state, uh, which is there, that there is a huge gap in pharmacist awareness of impact on air pollution, and we hope that that gap has been reduced since we've done, we've been doing this work with TCBI. Um, hence, we really think that there's a need for pharmacists to be trained and equipped. Uh, there is an opportunity for pharmacists to, to advocate proactively and become even breathe better um, advocates. Um, the call to action that has been developed needs to be implemented. And it's a vital tool that can be deployed um, by pharmacists in creating public awareness about the risks of air pollution. So the call to action, mobilizing pharmacists across our communities to mitigate the impact of air pollution on health was published shortly thereafter based on the roundtable and the outcomes of that. There are general calls in there, as well as more specific hands-on services statements. So I really invite everybody to um, read through the report and the call to action if you're interested in this particular area. It will really support um, you engaging with us in this event, as, long, uh, as well as in other events we're running this year on the same topic. Without further ado, I'm very, very, very pleased to welcome our panelists today, Lydia Morawska, Gary Wong and Tyler Knowlton. I'll hand over to Noor to introduce and welcome our first speaker, Lydia. Thank you, Noor. Thank you, Lina, and thank you everyone for joining. Uh, our first panelist today is Lydia Morawska, who's a distinguished professor at the Queensland University of Technology in Brisbane, Australia and is the director of the International Laboratory for Air Quality and Health at QUT, which is a collaborating center of the World Health Organization. Lydia also holds positions of vice chancellor fellow at the Global Center for Clean Air Research in the University of Surrey in the UK, and of adjunct professor at the Institute for Environmental and Climate Research at Jinan University in China. She conducts fundamental and applied research in the interdisciplinary field of air quality and its impact on human health and the environment, with a focus on science of airborne particulate matter. She's a physicist and received her doctorate at the Jagiellonian University in Poland, an author of almost 1,000 journal papers, book chapters, and refereed conference papers, Lydia has been involved at the executive level with a number of relevant national and international professional bodies, is a member of the Australian Academy of Science, and is a recipient of numerous scientific awards. Lydia, the floor is yours. Many thanks, Noor, for the introduction, for inviting me to this um, presentation. Good evening from Brisbane and good morning everywhere, wherever is, uh, is the morning. Title and the focus of my presentation, Science of Indoor Pollution. This is something which we could talk for the rest of the day. So in 15 minutes, which I have, I will just highlight some of the points which I consider are the most important. So first of all, um, when we talk about the science of indoor air pollution, we have to realize that um, this is a very dynamic, indoor air is a very dynamic, mix of pollutants with complex physical, chemical, microbiological properties, as you can see appearing in these different boxes and very strongly depending on the type of indoor environment. Dynamic mix because it's changing all the time. This means that there is no one solution to all the interiors and generalization is very difficult. 
But despite this, uh, we can still classify what affects uh, indoor air quality. And we could uh, organize it such. First of all, sources we uh, operate uh, or introduce, we humans, conditions we create for biological agents, biological, biological agents such as fun fungi, for example, we humans as a source and pollution that comes from outside. And on the top of this, there are factors which affect uh, all these sources. Now, what are the factors? This is um, kind of a, a eclectic list of some of the factors, not going into the detail of this. So when we are talking about indoor sources, we factors are how we uh, operate them, then building characteristics, ventilation rates, indoor pollutant sinks, meteorological conditions, which we don't control. And something very important, some of this are related to energy. And energy is a very important factor relating to building operations, to buildings, because energy consumes, well, about one third of energy we humans consume. So this, this is very important. Now, uh, of course, we are not going to talk about all the sources, all these factors. I just wanted to say a few words about um, us as humans, uh, as a source, because well, during the pandemic, this has been the most in the the, the interest uh, which um, everybody expressed. It is a very complicated. Our respiratory tract is a very complicated source. If we start from the lower parts of the respiratory tracts, um, the process which occurs there is um, fluid blockages during exhalation and then during the subsequent inhalation, the, uh, the blockage burst and particles are created. So this is one way in which the particles are created and cre created all the time because this happens particularly during um, um, breathing. Now, slightly different processes um, take place in the upper part, uh, in the larynx. Here we've got vocal fold, fold vibrations, and this then relates to particle formation and aerosolization. These particles are usually bigger. And then in the mouse, we have yet different processes. Here is during the process during speech articulation. These particles are usually bigger. Now, um, if pathogens, viruses, bacteria are present anywhere in the respiratory tract, they are atomized as well. So this is a very important source. And of course, this is the reason for respiratory infection transmission, airborne transmission, because these pathogens in these particles are in the air. Now, if all these pollutants were not related to uh, health effects, to risks, we wouldn't be talking about this. But of course, as you know, you expect there are health risks. <clears throat> what we've got here is indoor air quality asso uh, associated DALI in 26 European countries. Now, DALI is um, a way we express um, disability adjusted life years and um, build is burden of disease. Now, what we have here are the European countries and the bar bars, which are red and blue. <coughs> blue um, is national burden of disease in years per, per million from indoor exposure to pollution, pollution uh, pollutants uh, originating from outdoor air penetrating indoors and red contribution from what um, was generated from indoor sources. So as you can see, it varies from the countries, but the impact is incredible. And still not all the impacts were calculated here. And the pandemic gave another dimension or two dimensions of um, impact to what was calculated before. So let's talk for a moment now about mitigation, science and technology. This is presented um, in a schematic way in this diagram. 
which is from a paper which we've published at the beginning of the pandemic, how can airborne transmission of COVID-19 indoors be minimized? Now, there are a few ways uh, in a schematic way which are highlighted here. And I'll say a, a few words about sufficient and effective ventilation, that's the first one, and about particle filtration and disinfection. Now, there's always also avoiding early circulation during the pandemic, not necessarily all the time. And we can talk about this um, later when there's more time about this. So what is sufficient ventilation in relation to infection transmission? One could say, well, there are existing ventilation guidelines for controlling infection transmission. Perhaps we can use them, sure we can use them. Unfortunately, this is not as simple as this, because to find out, we cannot just use the existing guidelines, we need to use what's called assess, risk assessment models and tools. Now, they are based on a wells riley equation using infectious quanta. This is not new. This is something which was developed in 1930s and since then has been used. But during this pandemic, they really mushroomed these tools. Um, they, they got extended and are much more sophisticated now. Now, what is infectious quanta? <clears throat> It is the dose of infectious airborne particles required to cause infection in 63% of susceptible persons. This is Poisson's distribution, this is convention. Now, is this something which we know which is uh, the same for uh, different pathogens? Unfortunately not. We don't know this in advance if something in a new uh, virus, for example, or its variant appears. We don't know this um, value and it hugely varies between different pathogens. So this is a source of big complexity. But uh, retrospectively, we uh, find out this value, we calculate, we assess this value and what we did here with colleagues, we compared the, this um, quanta, infectious predictive quanta emissions for uh, pathogens for which these values are known. So if you look at this uh, distribution here, so on the or a vertical axis, we've got the pathogen starting uh, at the top with SARS-CoV-1 and then going MERS and so on. And at the, at the bottom is missiles. So missiles on this diagram is the most infectious uh, pathogen. But this was before um, Delta and Omicron came. So at the time when we published this paper, it was before um, um, this new variants. But if uh, you can see on this uh, diagram, which we've added, this red circle, this is Delta. Delta overpass missiles and Omicron overpasses uh, Delta in terms of being the most infectious respiratory um, pathogen known. So, okay, so these are the values which we know and based on this, we can calculate the uh, risk. And based on this, we can also come up with the values of ventilation, which would um, lower the risk. And interestingly, what we find out, what is the limit of ventilation in airborne trans, um, transmission of uh, in risk mitigation? So in this assessment we've done, and I'm not going to go into details uh, of, uh, of how it was done and for what uh, settings, because this would require much more, more time. But for this um, four most infectious at the time, of the assessment pathogens, we found out that even a high ventilation rate of 14 liters per second per person may be insufficient to maintain event reproduction number below one in a fully susceptible um, population. Now, depending on the, on the indoor occupants activities and for example, uh, activities, vocalization, any vocalization leads to much higher emissions than, than breathing. 
This value, 14 liters per second per person, may not tell you much is this high or is it low value. It is a very high ventilation rate. And by comparison, WHO suggests 10 liters per second per person. So such ventilation is such level of ventilation is often not feasible. This is not new. Uh, as um, kind of revolutionary as it may sound, it is not new. You probably may not see the details of this, but this is a paper published by Ed Nardell and colleagues in 1991 about the limit, theoretical limits of ventilation. So the problem is that we saw uh, such um, infectious pathogens, ventilation is may not be sufficient. So what shall we do? What to do? Disinfect the air but in a way that no additional pollute, pollution is uh, generated indoors. And how to do it? Using germicidal UV air disinfection, which has low energy requirements, does not generate new pollutants in the air, sil silent, robust, low maintenance, low cost. And if we consider the extension of this technology, it's not, not a new technology, but extension to what's called far UV, 229 nanometers, it's even safer because it has very low penetration into human tissue, which, does, which means it doesn't have to be in the upper room, it can be anywhere in the room. So it could be doing to the air what it, we already do to water. Every drop of water we drink from the tap is disinfected. And again, I'm stressing this is not a new technology. This is a photo from a, a um, school in, uh, in the US in 1930s when this technology was used to combat successfully combat missiles. So to summarize the vision for the future in relation to indoor air. We tried to present this vision in our paper published in Science last year, stressing the need for a paradigm shift to combat indoor respiratory infections and the need for building ventilation systems um, to which um, should be improved and uh, with the focus on healthy environment. Very important aspect here is that while we are focusing on respiratory infections, we cannot forget that there are other risks, many other risks and many other problems in indoor air pollu uh, uh, pollution or indoor air quality, and we cannot um, address them individually. They have to be considered together. So if we look at this um, diagram which, where, where, I, uh, where I'm trying to summarize these risks, so we've been talking during this presentation, during my presentation, I've been talking now about mitigation of airborne infection. But there is also pollu pollution coming from outside, like these fires which are ra raging in many countries right now. Um, there is also indoor anthropogenic pollution, so that these are the sources which we operate creating pollution. There's control of um, dampness and mold. This is the conditions which we generate for this biological agents. We need to take into account thermal comfort, which is extremely important. And all of this has to be considered at the time of building design now has to be considered. That's, that's the vision for the future. It should be considered during the building design, during heating, ventilation and air conditioning system design, building operation and keeping in mind energy. We cannot increase the energy buildings consume, but in, if anything, decrease. So the vision for the future is that there will be no naturally ventilated spaces that have no ventilation. We didn't have time to talk about this. Naturally ventilation means relying only on opening the window. And if it's too hot, too cold, too hot, the window is closed and there's no ventilation. Subsystems are not adequate. Indoor air quality standards will prescribe concentrations of indoor selected pollutants and be enforceable 
which means monitored in every indoor space. Right now, basically, no country has enforceable indoor air quality standards, and most countries have no indoor air quality standards at all, which comes to surprise of well, most people I talk to. Ventilation as part of heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system will be an element in enforcement of indoor air quality. And ventilation in shared spaces, I'm stressing in shared spaces, not ev everywhere, like in, in homes, we, um, we don't need to supplement ventilation with GUV, but in shared spaces, ventilation will be su uh, supplemented by GUV to control airborne infection. So I hope that we will have this vision coming um, turn into the reality, but it is complicated where science and technology are entangled with awareness and politics plays a very important role in all of this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lydia, for that very insightful scientific breakdown of indoor air pollution. I think it's really always important to go down to basics. Uh, I know we have a Q&A later, but I, ha I have a question that's very much linked to what you just said. Maybe I'll get that out of the way from Jose asking about UV. When you talking about UV, are you talking about mercury lamps or LED lamps? Well, mercury lamps is what we can use in with using far UV. But uh, if, if we if we start with even if we start with the um, uh, upper room UV, it still does the job. But in the future, we should look into mercury lamps and in far UV. Thank you so much, Lydia, for that. I have a question of my own, but I'll save that for later. Hopefully, I'll have time. And without further ado, we'd like to welcome our next speaker. And again, I'll give the floor to Noor to do the introductions. Thank you, Lina. Uh, our second panelist for today is Professor Gary Wong, who is an honorary consultant in the Department of Pediatrics at the Chinese University of Hong Kong. He obtained his undergraduate medical degree from the University of Alberta in Canada, and then went on to receive fellowship training at the Children's Hospital of British Columbia and a visiting fellowship at the Children's Hospital in Munich. Professor Wong's main research interests include treatment, control, and prevention of allergic conditions, including asthma, food allergy, wheezing disorder, and respiratory infections in children. He has served on both the board of directors for the Global Initiative for Asthma and the board of directors for the World Allergy Organization since 2019. He's one of the key experts on the advisory board of the Clean Breathing Institute, which is a GSK consumer healthcare scientific initiative. Professor Gary, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for your kind introduction and uh, allow me to uh, share with you uh, the views on a topic dear to my heart about the clinical impact and the health interventions for uh, what can we do to minimize the impact of air pollution on health and individuals. Well, um, earlier, uh, Lydia mentioned a variety of indoor components, in particular, she emphasized, of course, recently uh, about infectious agent and how one would be able to minimize troubles caused by infectious agents. And of course, you know, there are many other air pollutants. And of course, those generate from indoor burning, you know, uh, would be pretty obvious to many people. But in fact, there are many different ingredients, I should say, or pollutants that exist within a household. Now, now of course, you know, the gas cooking type stove, you know, usually would not result in this amount of pollution that you can see. But in fact, whenever you turn on a gas stove, there will be various types of pollutants as gaseous pollutant that you cannot see, such as the various oxides of uh, uh, nitric oxides, very, various type. 
And the other pollutant one must also pay attention to are the various, actually we call them the allergens, you know, the moles because of indoor moisture and also the various uh, volatile organic compound that evaporate or emit from uh, the painting, from the sofa. And all these things come together to form the mixture of indoor pollutants. And of course, you know, depending on the type of ventilation of the household, environmental outdoor air pollution also contributes to the level of pollutant within the household. You know, depending on how far you live from a highway, that dramatically affect the concentration of various pollutant inside the house. And when we talk about the potential health impact, we can divide it, people into you know, three big categories. You know, the first one, of course, we tend to think of are those individuals with pre-existing health conditions. In particular, those with a respiratory condition or a cardiovascular condition. You know, for those patients with, you know, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or asthma, because they have trouble within the airways and the lung parenchymas, any substance that get into the airways and the lungs will contribute further deterioration of the control of the disease. Those patients with allergic rhinitis, of course, the main problem is in the upper airway. But as we will see, you know, when you have bad or big troubles within your upper airways, actually that can affect the lower airways. And these patients during time of high level of pollution, you know, they would have, you know, problem like increased shortness of breath. If you measure the lung function using a special machine and ask them to blow the air out, you would document they have low lung function. And of course, you know, when they have airway inflammation or inflammation in the lung parenchyma, that would lead to asthma exacerbation, resulting in more coughing, sputum production, and eventually hospitalization. And there are also studies, you know, document the relationship of increasing level of air pollution actually associated with COPD deaths and asthma death. And of course, with all these little pollutants, particularly the smaller particles, when they get down to the lungs, they get absorbed into the bloodstream and actually would initiate a systemic inflammation and also clotting. And that would exacerbate patient with ischemic heart disease resulting in myocardial infarction and cardiac death. Now, of course, that's obvious for patients with pre-existing health conditions, but for other so-called healthy individual, at high level, whether it's indoor or outdoor air pollution, because of the various substance that will cause nasal irritation, they would have more nasal symptoms, runny nose, itch, sneezing, and resulting in uh, respiratory uh, complaints such as cough and shortness of breath, particular when they exercise. And these effect tends to be more prominent in younger children because of the minute ventilation per body weight. Of, it's actually higher than in adults. Now let's not forget the pregnant woman because when they are exposed, remember they have a developing fetus inside. And these pollutants, they will find the way into the bloodstream and then affect the placental circulation and get into developing fetus. And let's look at what are the potential problems. Now, of course, as I mentioned earlier, these minute particles, when they get into the bloodstream, they initiate a systemic inflammation. And of course, because many of these substances are quite active, resulting in uh, oxidative stress, many of these small particles get transported through the placenta to the fetus. And when these particles get into the fetus, it will actually cause 
different expression in certain genes. For, for example, the inflammatory genes would get upregulated. So it's in the lungs would be affected. And in fact, the structures of the lung would be affected, right? The obvious type of air pollution, of course, is maternal smoking or their uh, other uh, person smoking in their household. In fact, it would result in an infant who would have a birth weight lower than normal. And also these infants are more predisposed to the development of sudden uh, infant death syndrome. Now, what can we do to minimize the potential uh, detrimental health effect of these uh, indoor air pollutants? Well, first of all, we need to think of indoor air pollution as the cause of symptoms and the reason for deteriorating control. So when a patient with these diseases walk in, into the, the office, whether it's doctor's office, the nurse practitioner's office, the pharmacy, they complain that they're you know, having more trouble with the disease. We should ask ourselves, you know, what could be the potential reason? And, and often in whether it's developed countries or underdeveloped or developing country, pollution may play a very big role. Well, what we can do is, of course, we would be able to optimize the current therapy for their known health conditions. For example, patients with asthma, they may be on uh, inhaled corticosteroid. We will check whether they are taking medication, whether the techniques are correct. You know, those patients with allergic rhinitis, you know, if there is a combination of exposure to allergens plus exposure to pollutant, they will have an additive effect causing more trouble and more nasal symptoms. So we re review the, the adherence to medication as well as technique. And of course, if there is trouble with indoor uh, air pollution, of course, improving ventilation would help. But one would run into a big problem if a lot of the indoor air pollution actually comes from outside. So whether you, you know, bring more so-called fresh air in to the house would actually result in more trouble. Now, what are the things we can do? Now, of course, in an environment like these in developing countries, a lot of the indoor air pollutants are related to the burning of indoor biomass, which would result in varying size of particles, as well as gaseous pollutant. Now, for big particles or droplets, the use of mass can help, but now, a lot of the air pollutant generated by these burning or traffic or VOC, they are gaseous material. They will go right through your surgical mask or N95. So as a result, mass, the use of mass would not be particularly useful in protecting them. And, and also, one would also have to consider, you know, in patients with pre-existing disease, actually putting on an N95 and an N100 mask actually would create extra burden on the uh, breathing. Earlier, we mentioned about the potential additive effect of inflammation in the nose. Now, we tend to think of the upper airways and the lower airways, but in fact, they, there is a concept of so-called one airway disease, because if you have a patient with allergic rhinitis, for example, when there is increased inflammation within the nose, that would lead to pro the production of certain chemicals, or we, what we call cytokines, such as the interleukin-5, Five, which be produced in the upper airway, and it gets into the bloodstream, it would stimulate the bone marrow to produce a type of cells, eosinophils, which tend to worse. A lot of 
more systemic inflammation, leading to increased inflammation in the low airway, and hence more via low airway disease. So both of them actually interact with each other when they're exposed to various type of gaseous pollutant or various type of allergens. Now, this is one of the studies that uh, have been conducted. Now, when there are air pollutants, when it comes in through the upper airways, and of course, when it comes through the upper airways, when it comes through the upper airways, it will interact with the nasal epithelium. Now, of course, the pollutant or the chemicals or the pollens will stick in the upper airways. And if one would be able to get rid of them from the upper airway as soon as possible, it, there may be a chance of reducing the detrimental effect of these pollutants. And this is a randomized control trial looking at a group of pediatric patients using nasal rinsing, whether it's used a spray of 3% saline three times a day versus uh, the, uh, the control group without treatment. As you can see here, when you look at the rhino conjunctivitis score, the group that treated with saline uh, rinsing, you can see there is improvement in the score compared to uh, in improvement in the score with the treated compared with the control group, the upper one. Another way of looking at how well the nose is well controlled is the number of times they take the antihistamine. And again, as you can see here, the control group takes more uh, antihistamine on a weekly basis compared to the person who are the, the children who are taking the nasal rinsing. Well, there are various ways of cleaning the nasal epithelium, whether the use of nasal spray or drops. And there are also many studies and national guidelines recommending the use of nasal spray and drops. And, and, and I will recommend you, when you have time, you can look at this review paper published in Rhinology uh, last year, <coughs> reviewing the various studies of the use of nasal spray and nasal drops. And these studies include adults and children with allergic rhinitis, and also use of these drops during upper respiratory tract infection, and also the use, daily use of these drops in healthy individuals. Here, another study looking at the effect of the use of nas nasal saline spray. Now, there is this method called the saccharine clearance method. When you drop uh, a drop of saccharin, and the nasal mucosa with the cilia would move flick on a continuing basis. So if your cilia, a little hair on the surface of your nasal and bronchial epithelium, if they're not affected by other exogenous factors such as pollutant or pollens or allergens, they would move properly. And if they're affected, they get inflamed, the movement tend to be sluggish and also erotic. And this is a study comparing if one used either the 3% or 0.9% uh, saline spray and using these succulent tests to test them, whether there is any improvement. So if the cilia move faster, the person can taste the succulent earlier in the back of the mouth. And as you can see here, the use of both hypertonic saline or the normal saline would improve the saccharin clearance, suggesting the usefulness of such method uh, treatment. So one can uh, think about, you know, how can the pharmacy or pharmacists contribute to the prevention and management of the impact of pollution on patient and healthy individual uh, combating air pollution. 
Now, first, we need to be aware of the source and the effect of the air pollution that we have discussed. Second, we need to understand, you know, patient with pre-existing condition or without pre-existing condition, the symptoms can be related to air pollution. And we should advise those particular with pre-existing COPD or asthma that they should adhere to the prescribed treatment and review the technique. And also the potential treatment to improve the nasal hygiene. And we must be aware of the one airway system. When there is poor control of the nasal symptoms, that may result in poor control in the lower airways. And I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, uh, Gary, for that very uh, informative webinar. And I kept thinking there, will we see nasal hygiene be as common as uh, teeth hygiene? And will everyone start cleaning their nose like they clean their teeth? And I think looks like we're getting there, but we'll talk about that later. We do have some questions about that, but we'd like to hear from Tyler before we commence together and, and discuss. Noor, would you please introduce Tyler to all of us? Thank you, Lena. So our third speaker for today is Tyler Knowlton, who's the Director of Communications, Communities and Partnerships at Plume Labs. He's a communications and engagement strategist with more than 15 years of experience in the public, private and academic sectors, from Global Affairs Canada and the G20 Summit to local science education nonprofits. He specializes in developing collaborative partnerships and inter-organizational inter working relationships at the local, national, and international levels to tackle complex topics like air pollution. He recently returned to Canada from France and has settled in on Vancouver Island with his family. Tyler, the floor is yours. Thank you very much for the introduction. And, uh, and thank you to the, the two uh, preceding speakers to set the stage um, for what I'm going to talk to you about today, which is um, very much going from um, the description phase uh, of understanding air pollution and its effects on our respiratory system to the prescription. So going from description to prescription and what we're missing uh, on a quantitative level to get there. And uh, first to talk about um, our approach, our being Plume Labs, uh, which is very much a data and machine learning company. So we're looking to create information that people can use based on data. Uh, that's our approach. The more data you, you can get, uh, the more specific and measurable your actions can be. And we, we don't just focus on individuals, we're really looking to, to, to start with the person first, but also to contribute to literature. So many, many of the studies that have been referenced are based on being able to measure their participants or, or subjects level of air pollution exposure. And that data has to come from somewhere, um, but also at the policy level. How can governments have a positive impact on their uh, population's health? They need the data in, in order to enforce regulation, for example. Um, and so our approach is really to increase education and awareness and move people through, through a spectrum to action. So as you start to become more aware, you're able to take and have a desire to take action. But people hit a barrier. There's only so much you can do as an individual when you're faced with an institutional problem like air pollution. Um, so if we dig into this, um, you know, in our experience over the years working with various researchers and, and activists and policy experts, making that leap from describing a situation to actually prescribing an intervention, there's just types of data that are missing. So what would you need as an individual to make better choices? It's very similar to what a physician would need to prescribe some sort of uh, uh, a behavior change, for example. Um, and what we need to know is what type of pollutants are people being exposed to? Uh, to what degree? 
for how long and where that exposure takes place. Once you start to get these pieces of information in this data, uh, all of a sudden new interventions open up, both from the personal to the professional level. And this has been alluded to already, um, but that, that data is really difficult to get and not just um, in terms of indoor air quality, which we'll talk about, but in terms of outdoor air pollution data, why is this so difficult to get? Well, the sensor network is sparse and unevenly distributed. If you see this map, well, for one, sensor density that's actually measuring these pollutants outdoors, it's concentrated in most of the world where the air is the best, which is not always helpful when trying to, to really get into a global issue like air pollution. And even at the city level in London, for example, which is arguably one of the most sensor heavy cities, um, it's still not capturing the level of variation in terms of pollutant concentrations. And this is something that um, our team of data scientists looks at very closely is measuring air pollution levels and their variation over space, but also over time. Uh, so this is an example. If you go back and look at where the sensors are, we're able to fill in the gaps in between by using machine learning and modeling. And we have various techniques to, to be able to do this, but also to push the forecast, just like the weather forecast out in time. This is great, but instead of measuring places, in order to get that data we need to prescribe an intervention, we need to measure people, what people are breathing. And we as individuals and, and humans spend a lot of time in different environments indoors. That's not necessarily um, being reflected by the outdoor air pollution models. So how do we get at that indoor air quality? And if we go right back to the very beginning of this webinar, at the future state, it would be amazing to have sensors in every building being able to measure the indoor air quality and to bring that data to a central place for all researchers and, and policymakers to be able to make decisions based on that information. We're not even close. There's privacy issues, there's infrastructure issues, costs. It's incredibly, incredibly complicated to get there, but um, it's not impossible. And our approach has been to work with not only um, outdoor air quality modeling and monitoring, but also to be able to equip individuals with sensors on their persons, so wearables. And these are not evidential quality sensors that you would use to enforce regulation. They're designed to give a picture of holistic exposure across multiple pollutants for that individual. And we mix that data up with the outdoor air pollution models of maps and that, but also we need to use that to develop content to be able to get to that education and awareness piece. And I'd like to give you a practical application of this. Now this is with teachers in the United Kingdom, but if you could imagine that teachers are, um, they're a trusted frontline as in they have, they have a direct contact with the public and um, not only with their students, but with parents. So they're in a very strong position to increase that awareness and education level. So if you could project yourselves into the, that position to see how what we did with schools and teachers, how that might be applicable to pharmacists and pharmacies, um, I think there could be some interesting insights gleaned from this. So, um, this program was very much a collaborative exercise working with the community representatives, uh, subject matter experts, and then the scientific and technical uh, piece to be able to actually deploy sensors, model air quality indoors and outdoors of the schools over time, and then be able to design a 
custom intervention because every school is different. Every town is different. Every country is different. So we need to really look at what would it take to prescribe an intervention at the very a specific level. Um, and we had a two pronged approach for this where we not only did a data collection exercise using indoor sensors and outdoor, but also provided curriculum materials to the teachers to be able to deliver an air pollution focused learning experience for their students. And we measured before and after their level of awareness. And at the same time, we were collecting data on an ongoing basis to be able to feed that back at the end uh, to see how that would impact behavior change as well. So when we are looking, now this isn't a statistically significant, if we really wanted to do this in a very, you know, data sciences and rigorous way, we would have to scale this up and have a more robust data collection uh, schedule. But for the purposes of increasing awareness and uh, engagement, it, it was quite effective. And we, we, we have a split um, between urban, peri-urban and rural schools. Um, because oftentimes we think about air quality and air pollution as a, as a, a purely urban uh, phenomenon or, or problem. But what we learned is that's not necessarily the case. So let's look at the results of the actual hands-on learning and the perceptions and awareness and understanding side of things. So, you know, the before and after surveys delivered, um, we saw increases across the board um for for almost every every piece that we were measuring for going from knowledge uh just about what air pollution is the causes of and effects right down to how how the students and their parents feel about their level of empowerment are they actually able to make a difference um so that was that was a very positive outcome to this exercise that the level of awareness and engagement with the topic itself went up. Um, in terms of the data collection and analysis, so what we learned from the information collected that we were able to share back with those participants and then ultimately create an intervention. And we looked at you know, indoor versus outdoor was the obvious metric. Um, the students also carried a sensor on walks day to day, uh, measuring outdoor, and we won't focus on that for today, that that's more of a, an outdoor ambient air quality piece, but also the urban rural split, uh, what the differences were both indoor and outdoor. And here's an example of the, the uh, averages that we discovered. And in this slide, what's really interesting is that not all schools were the same. Some had indoor air quality that was much lower, so higher levels of pollution indoors versus the city average in those schools. And some were, some tracked along the indoor outdoor and others were slightly below. But what was very interesting for our team was seeing the difference. It wasn't necessarily always coming in from outside. Um, and, and this isn't a new discovery, but when, when illustrated at a student school in a very personal, hyper-local specific way that had a much greater impact than simply saying studies show that there are indoor sources of pollution that you can control. I mean, this was very personal. And to drill in even deeper, here's an example of one of the schools over time, uh, the data that was collected. And what, what is shown here, we can see that the main driving pollutant in the peaks was PM10. So that's quite coarse particulate matter. Uh, and we can infer from this, but what would be nice is to have some context from the teachers. We could say, what happened on this day where particulate matter spiked to such a high level? Um, because it's not related to an outdoor peak. Uh, so all of a sudden we can start asking questions about context. 
And I have a short video, but I'm actually going to skip it because we're really close to time, but I'm, um, we can share the link, I'm sure, um, in the chat or after. Uh, and this is a, a review interviews with some of the students and teachers about what it was like to participate in this. Uh, but I'd like to look at... Air pollution. I'm going to skip this and, and look at the conclusions. And these are similar to Dr. Wong's in that you know, what role can you play as, as experts and ambassadors um, for air quality? And what we learned from this exercise was that just simply informing and using, um, you know, climate commissions, communications, best practices that making something specific, um, local, personal, uh, that it goes a long way. Um, but asking questions uh, of, of your clients um, this is what we, uh, as data analysts, uh, really put back to the teachers was digging into those pollution peaks. So once you have the information, imagine if you had a sensor to give to, to your client, someone comes in, I'm having respiratory issues here, take this home and measure your air quality for a week and come, come back and let's talk. Uh, you can start to ask, well, what happened here? What happened there? What type of stove do you have? Or, um, you know, all of these things you can start to, to dig into. And that's when you can start suggesting. Um, maybe if, if uh, say you're going for a run at peak pollution times, you could go for a run early in the morning. There's all kinds of behavior changes, but that only goes so far. Um, there's what we've seen in our experience with this is that even with the data, even when people make, they do everything they can, they still hit a barrier where it's time to advocate for clean air policy uh, and to engage with institutions, either at the local, national or international level. And having all of this information and understanding leads to stronger advocacy, not just from a professional association, but also from patients and clients as well. So it all comes down to good data underpinning that information. And I'll, I'll leave it there because I know we're really tight on time. So thank you so much for participating and for your interest in this topic. Thank you so much for that, Tyler. So many questions come to mind. I just wanted to say, we actually have some time. So I'm wondering, Tyler, if we could play that video because I think that would be really um, beneficial for us to just see all of the that case study you mentioned in action. So do you mind if we actually play the video? No, oh, no, please, please. Perfect. Air pollution is bad for the environment because if it gets into your lungs, it can harm your breathing. It can make your asthma worse. We can't see it, but we can breathe it. The Actions to Breathe Cleaner initiative is a program to help get people, and particularly school children, to understand more about air pollution, what causes it, its effects on health and what you can do to help reduce it. We chose to participate because we know that pollution is one of the world's greatest environmental threats. I am worried about the impact of air pollution on our students because of the medical um, and health concerns that they have. With uh, over a thousand school children and as part of that the kids work as little detectives uh, so they go around with devices mapping where air pollution is highest around the school and on their route to school and then the kids can then think about okay well what are some of the actions we can take then to bring levels of air pollution down. The Actions to Breathe Cleaner initiative was created in response to the WHO finding that air pollution is really causing big problems for health and particularly for children. Since taking part in the study, we've decided to install vertical gardens inside the school and outside the school. Since learning about the effects, we've been closing the windows so less dirty air will come into the house. During the research of this study, we learned that our nose is our first natural defence. Air pollution gets stuck in your nose, so you need to clean it out before it reaches your lungs. At the school, we have the Eco Warriors and we take part in different activities where we help the community and we consider ways that we can have an impact on the environment. We are the Warriors of the Environment. We are committed to protect our neighbourhood and keep it eco-friendly.
We didn't realise that this area had quite so much pollution, especially as we're not too close to a main road. My favourite action to breathe cleaner is the one where you change your route uh, to get somewhere, like to get to school. Yeah, I had a scooter. It was normal, but I, but it just disappeared one day, so I used walking. And I have an electric scooter. It don't produce smoke. Personally, as an action to breathe cleaner, I'll be driving less and walking more. I found out that... Okay, that's really great. Thank you so much. And I'm going to uh, actually ask Noor to go to the panelist slide and maybe invite I'm all of our speakers to come, on, to come on camera. Oh, that was the video cutting off. That's fine. I'll invite our panelists, Lydia, Gary, Tyler, if you could come on camera. We have a few minutes um, for a discussion before we close the session. And, and first, I want to start by thanking you so much. Uh, we started with the science behind it all, the impact on air pollution, and then how this really makes sense in, in real life. And seeing that example from Tyler really brings it uh, home as well. And I think this is now, maybe I'd ask a one question to all of you and then I have some specific ones for each of you. Maybe bringing it back closer to home home, which is pharmacy. And from your, your perspective, uh, maybe starting with Lydia about, you know, the role of health professionals in general in pharmacy. What is your view on, on the importance of that in tackling indoor, indoor air pollution? And, and then hearing the views from each of you from your perspective would be really helpful in, frame, in painting a bigger picture. So can we start with you, Lydia? Well, in my view, it's an extremely important role because as we've heard, air pollution plays such an important role and usually um, not realized and not considered as a factor. So if uh, someone has a problems, patients has a problems and present themselves with the problems and air pollution as a factor um, is not taken into account, so it cannot be properly treated. So pharmacists being able to recognize that it, it could be the air pollution, which is playing a role here. It's just a key of key importance. Thank you for that, Lydia. And while you're with us with your mic on, I do have a question from Arlene in the chat asking about, is the air purifier necklace effective against pollution? And I don't know, I don't know much about the air purifier necklace. Could you tell us more? I've seen this technology. Basically, there hasn't been any single technology which I haven't seen during this pandemic. But this is not really the way to go with this kind of devices because they are, well, gimmicks. They don't do much. Okay, that's really helpful. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, I'll go around to Gary, come back to Lydia in a bit. But Gary, could you tell us more about, again, your perspective on, and view on the role of health professionals, including pharmacists? in tackling the indoor air pollution and its impacts. Yeah, I think actually for this problem, you know, uh, pharmacy, pharmacists and the nurse practitioner, have, they have huge role, you know, because, you know, in general, you know, when a patient goes see a doctor, usually it's during in bad exacerbations. And usually the doctor is too busy just looking after that episode of problem without spending a lot of time going through, you know, what your patient is doing, what your patient is supposed to, you know, how would your patient go to work? You know, all of these factors actually contribute to exposure to the aggravating factors. You know, for example, you know, if someone, you know, have actually increasing symptoms, you know, related to the disease, you know, asthma or COPD, you know, very often, you know, when they refill the prescription, you know, one obvious thing is they tend to refill the bronchodilator more often, for example. The pharmacist would realize, oh, are you having, you're using a bit more of this, you know, you know, rescue inhaler, you know, and then, of course, depending on where the patient lives, how the patient gets to work, what type of indoor environment is, and, the pharmacist would be in a great role of educating the patients and also, you know, potentially offer some potential, you know, uh, treatment. So, so huge role for 
community pharmacy and pharmacists. Thank you so much, Gary, for that supporting the advocacy. Uh, Tyler, um, what about your views? Yeah. Um, you know, to add to that, I, I, I've seen the very local relationship that pharmacists have with their clients um, and that you could draw a, a radius around the pharmacy for where people come from. Mm -hmm. um, and having a strong understanding of local pollution, uh, breakdown levels, trends, uh, you know, country by country in Poland in the winter, for example, high levels of particulate matter coming from heating uh, and how it's different in um, from other places. Just having that local knowledge and being a trusted source uh, for that information can have a great impact on people's own behavior of how they understand uh, the phenomenon and the, and the issue and the actions that they could take to reduce their own exposure. And one other piece is that adding your voice as a professional um, actor in this space to put pressure on when a policy exercise comes out or to advocate for uh, different modes of transport, adding your voice to the dialogue can be incredibly powerful, especially when you're underpinning that with the data. Thank you, Tyler. That's a really powerful message. And I think uh, for pharmacists to reach that point, we really have to enable them and empower them with the knowledge themselves. And I really think that doing this, um, you know, with our initiative, FIP, partnerships with institutes like TCBR and experts like you is a really good starting point because even, you know, the results from the round table last year, we, we realized that there's a huge knowledge gap. Uh, and there's not much awareness by pharmacists on their own role. So I think empowering them is a really good step to reach that. But I think they need to feel really enabled to do that. I agree. I have a couple of questions back maybe or to Lydia. Lydia, we're talking about um, disinfection uh, of air and all of that. And that made me think, you know, disinfection became such a huge normal trend during COVID. And did COVID accelerate this? for the wider air pollution agenda? You know, are we in a better place because, before, you know, because of COVID? Is this a silver lining? Could you tell us more? Well, there's been a lot of action and a lot of progress in this. The question is how much of this will stay permanently? How much of this will disappear when hopefully COVID eventually will disappear? In terms of this air, well, ventilation in general, but air disinfection as well, they've been, well, a lot of discussion. Um, some of you might have heard about the initiative by the um, uh, White House, the Biden administration, where they announced an, a clean air challenge. So this is sort of very progressive, including, uh, well, ventilation in general, uh, air disinfection and so on. How far this would go, we don't know yet, it depends how, how well it will be funded. But this, this is a very, very important step forward. And in other countries, it's ha happening as well. It's very um, heterogeneous. For example, in Australia, uh, the state of Victoria is very progressive and doing a lot. The state where I am in Queensland is not really doing anything in this. In this. So it is really how much we will be able to, um, to push this whole agenda such that it reach the state of national the standards such that it stays. Because if there are only certain things which will be the, uh, uh, done now, improvement of this, improvement of this, this may disappear with time, particularly if there's any cost, cost involved with anything. So the most important is to bring these changes to national standards. And if this happens, it will stay. Thank you, Lydia. And one more follow-up uh, to what you just said. Um, do you think that all the climate crises, policies and calls to action are also benefiting indoor air pollution or is that not big enough within that agenda? Well, these are related aspects. Um, related aspect in that sense that outdoor air pollution is a huge factor in impacting on indoor air pollution. 
So we cannot disjoin this 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 two. And um, now, uh, if we if we are dealing with just natural ventilation, open the window. Open the window means that we are bringing all the pollutants from outside. So this by itself is not solving the problem. We need to have much more advanced systems such that we can open the window when it's possible. But if it's not possible, we close the window, we filter the air, we make sure that we are not losing energy, which we um, invested in this. So, so energy is part of this as well. So these two aspects are very closely related and cannot be disjoint. Thank you, Lydia. There's so much to discuss, honestly. It's uh, it's all very linked. And, you know, Tyler spoke about outdoor pollution. There's indoor pollution. There's opening the window. It's very complicated. And, and to think that opening the window isn't the safest way to ventilate is also worrying. Um, Gary, I have a question for you from a more of a clinical point of view. And then I'll ask a question from the audience that just came up, which is, where are we in terms of clinical advances with tracing the causes of respiratory diseases? So are we in a better place in terms of saying this respiratory disease is direct cause of air pollution or we don't know? Because I think that really impacts awareness. So where are we with that? I think let's, let's start with, you know, what would it do to an individual first now, definitely, you know, there have been a lot of studies looking at the lung function development in children. If the children live in place with high level of pollution, as they grow older, the lung function will be less than those children who are from a more clean environment. So we know that for sure. And now, as you understand, you know, children actually, they tend to be outdoor a little bit more than adults. And they also tend to exercise more. Now we know exercise in general, it's good for the children. But in fact, if the children exercise in a polluted area, actually the gain from the exercise actually probably is offset by the exposure to the pollutant. And if they start with lower lung function, as they grow older, depending on what type of exposure they have, if they are also exposed to cigarette smoke, for example, they are more likely to develop COPD at the later stage in life. So definitely in terms of environmental pollution in certain disease, it's very clear. And also the relationship of environmental pollution making patient with pre-existing disease more difficult to control, worse lung function, more exacerbation, and requiring a higher dosage of medication to control the illness. It's quite clear. I think what is not so clear is now, even in the most polluted places, you know, for example, if you look at indoor air pollution in Indian subcontinent, where there are a lot, or Africa, where there is very bad indoor air pollution, you know, there will be, yes, a lot of people will be affected, but there will be also individuals that are not so affected by the pollution, you know. And if you look at some of the allergic disease per se, it's actually, it's a combination of pollutant and also other factors that contribute to the development of the allergic disease. To name an example, if you look at Australia, New Zealand, you know, they have the highest prevalence of asthma in the world. But if you look at the air quality in New Zealand, you know, it's, you know, much better than in Poland, but, the prevalence of asthma in Poland is much lower than that in New Zealand. So, so different factor contributes and it's not, you know, having one factor would result into a disease. So it's multifactorial that they interact with each other resulting in the manifestation of disease and also result in the poor control of the conditions. Thank you, Gary, for illustrating the answer so well. Tyler, I'm gonna come back to you on a question about 
Uh, and I know we're going to be working with uh, the Clean Breathing Institute on this this year a little bit more about the role of pharmacists in measuring air quality themselves. And, and more about that, can you tell us more about, you know, how important is measuring air quality and where do health professionals come in? Sure. Um, one <clears throat> interesting study that is ongoing right now at the Children's Hospital in Los Angeles is looking at um, pre-operative, so someone going in for a respiratory, a surgical intervention, uh, children, and looking at their pre-op particulate matter exposure levels to see what impact that has on the number of unscheduled escalations to ICU, so post anesthesia. So if, if, the, if the children are exposed to a high level of particulate matter, they go in for the operation, they, they go under, they're anesthetized, and how does that um, exposure impact their, their outcomes? Now, uh, one of the missing pieces is indoor air quality data. We can say that they live in this part of LA, the, the outdoor ambient air quality is this level at that street address. We can infer that that air pollution is coming inside, but we don't know what they're breathing at school, on how they get to school, on the bus. We're not getting that holistic picture. Um, one of the things that physicians can do is actually prescribe measuring. Um, so can you keep a pollution journal Pre, pre-op, if you, you know, if you don't have a sensor, there's a lot we can learn from behavior. Um, or if they do happen to have a sensor, can we measure those, those indoor exposures? So if you think about going to the pharmacy to prepare for some kind of intervention, again, it comes down to education. So letting people know you're going to have a better outcome if you do this or if you do that. So ha having the data is, is so critical. And, and having someone to help collect it is even more so, especially when we get into private spaces, like indoors in the house. Thank you so much, Tyler. I have one last a roundup question for all of you. Um, I'm going to put on my equity hat and ask you about air pollution in this way, because we heard from Lydia uh, all about ventilation, disinfection. Gary mentioned, mentioned nasal hygiene. Tyler, we touched on monitoring. But all of this de progress depends on patients and professionals having access to those tools to disinfect, to ventilate, to um, uh, you know keep uh, a hygienic uh, nasal uh, pathway, to monitor. So without tackling the equity question and access to those, we can't really see progress, except in some countries where this is on top of the agenda and they're willing to fund all of this. So maybe this is a bit of a bigger question about access and equity in health, but you know, in your opinion, what is the one action we should be prioritizing if we'd like to tackle it that way? So let's start with Lydia. Well, this pandemic showed that inequity is a very, very big factor and people who are not well off were significantly worse affected by the pandemic for all kinds of reasons. So there's absolutely no doubt about this. Uh, I'm still coming back to the issue of standards, because if there are standards, then the whole uh, nation has to adhere to the standards. It's not easy. Uh, now, I, I, know, I know that Tyler said that we are not there yet um, technologically to measure pollutants. We can technology, technologically measure already some pollutants and many and some of the pollutants like carbon dioxide are already measured in most inter interiors. So if we are able to put the national standards not expecting that the standards will be adhered to, well, next week, next year. This will take time. This will take 10 years, this will take 20 years. I'm often coming back to the issue of water quality when there were times that there were no clean water uh, flowing from the um, taps. And it took from the time when that revolution started in England, it took a long time and it, it's still not even completed. There are still places which don't have clean wa water in the tap. But if we start with the standard, we, we, it was start with putting standards in place and with long-term agenda for implementing the standards, 
then things start cha changing, and then standards will be hopefully with time have impact on everybody so that inequity will start disappearing with time. As I said, it's a long-term agenda, but in my view, that's the only way to go. Thank you, Lydia. That's very hopeful. <laughs> Gary, uh, what are your thoughts on that? We heard standards, and I think I agree that's a starting point for regulating and then everybody getting at least the similar quality. Gary. Oh, could you unmute, please, Gary? Thank you. you. Know, the thing about air pollution, it's, it's quite fair. You know, if all of us go out to the street, you know, whether you're a millionaire or whether you, you live somewhere with making, you know, barely make ends meet, you're going to breathe the same air, all right, first thing. So it's quite equal in terms of the air that you breathe. But, um, and of course, when you go back into the house, depending on the location. Now, if there are established national standards along with monitoring station, and also, you know, there are actually, uh, I, uh, there are production of smaller and smaller, cheaper and cheaper personal monitor of air pollution these days. And, but even with the stage monitoring station, whether at street level and, or at, you know, the top level of a building, these information are actually freely available in most countries. And I think we should, through education, that our patients are aware of these numbers, you know, which part of the cities are more polluted? How, how can you get away from the traffic and avoid heavily trafficked uh, pollution? And also how to minimize indoor air pollution. And these things are actually, you know, we can do if, the patients and the people are educated. So I think uh, each of us within the healthcare sector, you know, whether you're a scientist, you're you know, nurse practitioners, you're pharmacists, you're doctors, all of us should contribute in educating our patients of their awareness. And then they can take the appropriate steps to protect themselves. Thank you so much, Gary. And last but not least, Tyler. Yeah, from, from the equity perspective, um, you know, um, I hate to challenge you on this, uh, Dr. Wong, but the, the American Lung Association released the state of the air report and air, air quality and pollution levels, the, poor, the, the poorer you are, or, you know, the darker skin you have, the worse air you breathe. Um, that's what the data shows. And, and it's, it's brutal because that population has less tools and resources and ability to move from their neighborhoods if necessary. I mean, we've seen legislation and legal outcomes in the UK um, on this, that, that the state was liable for the death of a young black woman. But that is very serious. And so when it comes to data equity, if you look at my map of where the sensors are, the people who need to measure the most don't have the data. So there's, there's environmental inequities, there's data inequities. And to get back to the regulatory piece, um, having the data, not just to understand, but to enforce. So the WHO has fabulous thresholds and standards for exposure levels to air pollution, but there's no way for countries to enforce those, those standards and thresholds. So having an AQI, an air quality index, that's linked to local regulation that can be enforced through data, I think is critical, especially when it comes to equity, to measure and enforce uh, for the benefit of the, the populations who may not be able to affect an intervention on their own behalf. Thank you, Tyler. And perhaps this is maybe where the single most important role for pharmacists and healthcare professional comes in is they could help collect that data through air monitoring and reduce that data gap, which impacts everything. No standards without data, no monitoring without data. Data is the center of it all. 
I want to, on this note, a uh, really uh, powerful one, thank you all for being with us today. And I appreciate your contribution. This has been so, um, I don't know, I've been really touched and, and just feel very moved. And I wanna go back to work and see what else we can do about this. Um, we do have another webinar coming up on the same issue in September. Dates will be announced soon. So this is for everyone here with us to please join us. We've linked to the um, events website. Uh, on which the webinar will be announced. Um, and for all future FIP digital events, you can go to events.fip.org. And I think we also uh, want to invite you to our uh, Congress, the FIP World Congress, the 80th one after three, a three year hiatus because of COVID, We're finally getting back together in person in Seville, which really hope you can make it. Uh, please visit our website uh, and register and we really hope to see you there. I wanna say a final thanks again to Lydia, Gary and Tyler. We have been really honored um, to have you here with us today and we look forward to seeing you in more FIP events and webinars. Thank you so much. Thank you, Noor, and thank you to TCBI. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Bye. everyone. Bye-bye.